Well, hello there. How are you doing, my fellow geeks and nerds? The course on how to social science has really gotten a lot of positive feedback in the comments and a lot of interest. And in order to continue to, you know, go along this path and continue people's interests, give them what they want, I am going to be continuing on with my lecture series here with this time the philosophy of social science part two, looking more at the quant side of things. And then probably in the next lecture, I'll get to the quantitative qualitative divide. I will also say that it is the middle of May. It is a gorgeous summer day. And I've just, I've finished work recently. I'm sitting in my house to record this and I have my window open to get as near as possible to the lovely weather. And therefore there will probably be some background noise occasionally as cars drive by. Hopefully it won't interfere with your sound enjoyment too much, but it's just too nice a day to close the window. So I'm gonna ask you guys to bear with me. When we are examining social science from a foundationalist uh, ontology and we're approaching it using epistemological methods that assumes that the social world contains factors that are independent of mind and operate independently on humans. Like they have a causal effect. That is the position that we're going to be taking up in this lecture. So the last time we thought about the role of meaning and values and the way that we construct our understanding of reality, of what reality is based on our perceptions and how societies are can be pools of knowledge, all that kind of stuff, the way that things are socially constructed, basically. But in this lecture, we're now going to be adopting an approach that relies on statistical inference, and therefore we need to talk, talk about causal mechanisms, and we need to test hypotheses in order to investigate or, you know, to test theories. Basically, we're using hypotheses to evaluate the strength of our theories. What do we mean by theory in this context? As you know, the word theory has unfortunately been used in common everyday language to mean conjecture or opinion or speculation. Anything that is not based on facts can be called a theory. However, in the sciences, and when I talk about the word theory, and when I use the word theory when discussing social science and social investigations. I have a very specific idea of what the word theory means based on my research question and data and the things that I want to, you know, understand about the world at the end of the process. So in the sciences, and that includes the social sciences, a theory is a logical explanation of the manner of interaction of a set of phenomenon or a set of phenomena. It may contain a testable model of the manner of interaction of that phenomena, be capable of predicting future occurrences, and be capable of being tested or otherwise falsified through empirical observation. Let's use something from the natural sciences. The theory of evolution is a logical explanation of the manner of the interaction of a set of phenomenon, that being time, sexual selection, and natural selection combined with reproduction and variation. Those are the phenomenon that work together to produce the outcome that we observe as the evolutionary process. That theory with those various components therefore contain a testable model of the manner of interaction of those individual elements to produce the phenomenon. If we understand how the theory of evolution works, we should not be able to say, predict specific occurrences of evolutionary variation, but we will be able to predict that variation and even speciation can occur, maybe even in short time periods, as we've seen with um, some of like the fruit fly results and, and other microbes when they do a lot of repeated testing and um, with smaller, simpler life forms in order to get more generations through. And of course, this set of um, logical explanation of the manner of the interaction of phenomenon is being capable of being tested or otherwise falsified through empirical observation. We know that if we find, you know, rabbit bones in, you know, when the dinosaur with alongside dinosaur bones, I don't know all of the very, you know, like the Cambrian explosion, I don't know all of the, the way, the order in which those happen, so I don't want to make a fool of myself. But if we found rabbit bones next to dinosaur bones, we would have either a hoax or a really serious problem for the theory of evolution. So the pos it is possible that we could come across evidence that would re make us rethink the theory 
because it's been shown to be wrong. And the capacity of being shown to be wrong, and that test of um, the null hypothesis that I talked about last time, is, is really, in my opinion, the key that sets aside, um, that separates scientific work from non-scientific work. That's not to say that non-scientific work, for instance, descriptive analysis, describing phenomenon is not scientific because you're not testing a, uh, a hypothesis. That doesn't mean it's not worth doing descriptive analysis. You just have to realize that you don't get to make the step from description or correlation into inference and generalization. But I don't want to get too far out of myself. How do we develop theories? There are, I will say, two sort of main classifications and then the third one which is the iterative approach. Deductive theories and that is going from a theory to the world. You have a theory of how the world works. You have a, an idea of a causal mechanism. Let's say again like the older you get the more likely you are to vote. From this theory of saying that the older people get the more likely they are to become politically invested through the experience of paying taxes and interacting with government officials and their own interests being closer to you know, what's happening in government. Therefore, hypothesis, the older someone is, the more likely they are to vote. The null hypothesis would be the age in years is in no way related to the vo uh, whether or not someone chooses to vote, or age is not significant when predicting someone's likelihood of voting. You would then well, not maybe you go out and data collect, but someone, if you're doing a national study, will collect the data, or maybe you're lucky and you get funding, you can collect the data yourself, and then you run models that allow you to generate findings, and from that you get to one of three results. Either the hypothesis is confirmed, which would mean that everything you said turned out to be the case. So if I said the older you are, the more likely you are to vote, and that result was statistically significant and positive, showing that for every one year that someone aged, their likelihood of voting would go up by, I'm just going to make up a number here, 0.27. Then I can say that my hypothesis was confirmed. If I have a different study and I find that um, I'm talking about uh, an interaction effect with age and women and saying that old, the older um, you are, um, you more likely you are to vote, and women are more likely to vote than men, therefore, the, old, the people most likely to vote will be old, the women who are the oldest or older women. And let's say in my sample that older men were just as likely to vote as older women. So even though I had the idea about getting older being important to voting, my hypothesis would only be partially true because part of it, that bit about women being the most likely, was not um, sustained by the evidence. The other option is rejected, like you don't have enough evidence to reach the level of statistical significance, therefore you can't reject the null hypothesis, you have to accept the null hypothesis, and therefore you have to reject your alternative hypothesis. I think the note about previous rational choice example was deductive. I think that must have been in from the lectures, and I don't know what that refers to, so I'm going to skip it, because these lectures are a couple years old now. Inductive theory, that's more of a qual approach, goes from the world to the theory. You want to investigate let's say, people's perception of political party leaders. And no one has ever collected data from respondents before. They've always just sort of given people a list or they haven't asked the question in an open-ended way. They would ask a 10-point scale. How likable is this person? How trustworthy is this person? Then if you wanted to understand how voters were talking about political leaders, perhaps to come up with a better explanation of why party, the role of party leaders, let's say in outcome elections, then you would go and collect all your data and observe it. And from your observations, you would try to find patterns or other associations that appear again and again. And those associations would form the basis of your theory that you would then make into a deductive hypothesis testing theory and go and collect data and use statistical analyses to check what you've generated from your qualitative analysis. Now, a lot of researchers don't do one or the other. What we all tend to do, I think, is do an iterative approach, a back and forth. A quantitative person might, you know, run an initial model with a, a pre-existing, let's say they do a rational choice analysis. They want to know whether or not the probability of benefits minus the cost to somebody is going to make them more likely to vote. So they make a model that operationalizes all of these cost and benefits 
and put them in a model. And they run the model and it's not very successful. And rational choice is not a very good way of explaining vote behavior. They then chuck out, they're going, okay, well, I can't overcome the null hypothesis that people vote for on the basis of utility. But what if I included the value of expressing yourself into this model? And you have what they call, at least it did back in the day, the D term. And that indicates measures for the, the gratification people get from expressing their opinions. And when you put that in there, then the model performs much better. So this is the process of refining a model is very common. When Karl Popper talked about the uh, being willing to throw out your theory if it's been shown to be wrong, it's it shouldn't be too, taken to too much of an extreme. Occasionally what is wrong is that it's not that your whole theory is a problem, it's just one part of your theory is a problem. So you may have misunderstood how a certain component of your causal mechanism functions in a society and you need to take that into account. Or there are other things that you um, need to include in the model to control for variation in order to isolate the effects. That's not to say that bad theory should stick around. I mean, phrenology turned out bad results all the time. It, it was unreliable because it was not built on a, on a solid foundation. But we also shouldn't always throw the baby out with the bathwater. And occasionally when we get a a, re a, th a result from our theory that we're not expecting, instead of going right away, okay, well, the theory has just been falsified, so we can chuck it all out. There has to be a stage there, I think, where you go, okay, well, why was it, was it a problem with the research design first? Was it a problem with the data collection? Was it a problem with the data analysis? Or, you know, what was there an issue here that we should take into consideration that explains why the theory didn't work in this situation. So it's not as quite as easy as, you know, you get a result of falsifying a theory and then you just throw the theory out. There is that process of going back and forth between the world iteratively, I'm sorry, inductively looking at observations and then deductively testing them. Deduction is reasoning that proceeds from general principles or premises to derive particular information. Using theories, the researcher deduces testable hypotheses. To test the hypotheses, operational terms are created. Data is analyzed to determine if the hypothesis fits the results or is refuted by the results. And the last step in the deductive process is that abduction or retroduction, taking the results of a particular result and inferring things about the theory. Using inductive methods, theory is the outcome of your investigation, not the starting point. Inductive methods start with observations and builds up on these observations to try to get to generalizations. It's used in exploratory studies where there are no established theories, and it's used a lot, obviously, in qualitative research. The theories that have been developed by inductive methods can then be tested deductively in other situations. However, Merely observing patterns is not an explanation of the patterns. We must be aware that things can drive the pattern which might not be directly observable. There's a danger when using induction to not see the forest for the trees. Consider this excerpt from Bertrand Russell's Inductivist Turkey. The turkey found that on his first morning at the turkey farm that he was fed at 9 a.m. Being a good inductivist turkey, he did not jump to conclusions. He waited until he had collected a large number of observations that he was fed at 9 a.m. and made these observations under a wider range of circumstances. On Wednesdays, on Thursdays, on cold days, on warm days. Each day he added another observation statement to his list. Finally, he was satisfied that he had collected a number of observation statements to inductively infer that I am always fed at 9 a.m. However, on the morning of Christmas Eve, he was not fed, but instead had his throat cut. The thing here is that just because you observe something happening doesn't mean you can then generalize from that observation to the wider world. This would be, a, I think, close to a hasty generalization fallacy. The key here is that you can't go from, an, from observation even if you have a lot of observations and drawing conclusions in terms of a causal relationship, you have to use deduction to test relationships to make sure that the source of the variation isn't just, I get fed every, every day at 9 a.m. because that's how the world is. 
what he what the turkey was missing was the underlying motive of why the farmer was so keen to feed him every day at 9 a.m. And that's because the farmer was looking forward to Christmas Eve when he would be feeding on the turkey. As I said, in reality, researchers use both deduction and induction as part of the research cycle. Generally, there's if you're looking at it from the, like the more of a social science part of things in terms of the scientific method, you ha generally have a theory from that you derive hypotheses. There's the data collection, generate your findings, your hypothesis is confirmed, partially confirmed or rejected. Then you revise the theory a little bit. Maybe you take into account some more variables or you think of other things that might explain um, the variation that you found and you control for it. that because maybe you've come up with something, uh, an idea that refines the theory. Then you generate another hypothesis and you do more data collection and generate the, those findings and test whether your revised hypothesis has been confirmed, partially confirmed, or rejected. And then you take it back to the world and you revise your theory. That's more accurately the way that knowledge is produced and that science is done. We've talked a lot about ontology and epistemology, and now we're coming on to methodologies. Methodologies versus methods, what is the difference? Methodology goes to the question of how do we know? Methodology is an investigation of the concepts, theories, and basic principles of reasoning on a subject. Think of methodologies as a toolbox and methods as the tools within the toolbox. When it comes to quantitative methods, ontologically we're assuming that social reality is an objective external thing that's out there that we can observe and measure it normally proceeds from a positivist epistemology using the ideals and practices of the natural sciences, including the scientific method. It tends to use deductive approaches where an emphasis is placed on theory testing or model competition. And examples of quantitative methodologies include statistical methods to analyze data and to test or compare models. So the methodologies here, the way that we will know about the world, relies on statistical methods of analysis. Qualitative methods, on the other hand, ontologically assume that social reality is constructed by the social actors themselves. It normally proceeds from an interpretivist perspective, rejecting the ideals and practices of natural science, and instead tries to understand how social actors perceive, interpret, and operate within their social realities. It tends to use inductive approaches where an emphasis is placed on generating theories. And that generation of theories comes from the generation of data. So our approaches to generating qualitative data include interviews, focus groups, and ethnographies. So our methodology is that which allows us access to or produces text, language, images, things that people have created or have talked about that allow us to use those inductive approaches. And then we get to the quantitative qualitative divide. I think this might be a good opportunity for us to just stop the lecture here because the next section will be again contiguous and should be given all in one spot. This is probably from most of you a review because it's very typically from the perspective of natural sciences. But again, the reason why I did the qual approach first is that I wanted to contrast the options that social researchers have to investigate the social. And that's not just limited to survey-based data. It is a wide range. It includes experiments, lab experiments, and field experiments, I guess you could do, and of course, all of the qualitative approaches. And keeping this array of toolboxes and tools in mind as we go along, it's a good way to think about it because as you start to think about research questions, you can see that a researcher could, in theory, you know, perhaps do an experimental investigation, do a survey-based investigation, and then do interviews and try to observe the phenomenon in interest in three different modes. If they were to go out and do that independent research, or if people did it, you know, three different people did this research on the same question, but came at it from different approaches, and they all converged on an answer, or the answers interacted with such a way that, you know, like the qual stuff complemented the quants. This, I think, is, you know, a really good way of this triangulation of becoming more certain about what we're identifying in the social world. Another lecture that I think I might have to add, because it's not in here, but 
since I have the time, why the heck not? There is a whole thing I didn't have a chance to do in the course on the important role that feminist critique has played in improving social science, and in particular, questioning the the values that were imported from the natural sciences that treat the things that you're studying as objects and not really looking at the human relationship between the researcher and the subject or participant. And I want to, yeah, unpack that a little bit more and show how that critique has really improved research done in the social sciences. All that's left to be said is that I've been Christy. You've been a nerd and a geek, and that is what makes you awesome. And I will see you guys in the next lecture or in the next video. But either way, it'll be pretty soon. Bye.